morning. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the 17th Annual Cosumnes River College and Sacramento State Center for Practical and Professional Ethics Fall Ethics Symposium, The Ethics of Providing Healthcare. My name is Rick Schubert. I'm Executive Director of the Symposium Series of which this event is a part. Our current session is entitled, Ban, Subsidize, Mandate health policy in the U.S. Our presenter is Dr. James Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an associate professor of economics at Providence College, a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, and a senior affiliated scholar with the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. His research interests include health economics, labor economics, and entrepreneurship. He received his BS in economics from the University of Tulsa and his PhD in economics from Temple University. Our session will be an hour and 20 minutes in length and divided roughly equally between our speaker's presentation and a question and answer session with you, the audience. As a segue between Dr. Bailey's presentation and the open Q&A, we'll hear briefly from two formal respondents, Hannah McKino, an honors program student at Cosumnes River College, and Catherine Goodickson, Senior Health Policy Researcher for the Source on Healthcare Price and Competition. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bailey to the podium. Hey everyone, um, thanks for uh, the welcome and thanks for the invitation. Uh, so in, uh, in the previous talk, uh, I think you just heard a great explanation of the um, economics of competition in healthcare. Um, I'm an economist, but, and um, you'll see some of that in the talk, um, but if anything, I might move things in a, a bit of a different direction, um, as you'll see. Okay. Um, so I want to start with, okay, very standard Economics 101 point, uh, which is that uh, we have to make these decisions all the time that involve trade-offs, where uh, we live in a world of scarcity. Uh, you often want more than you have, um, you can't always get everything you want, and so you need to make these choices that involve uh, trade-offs, where in order to get more of one thing you want, you might have to give up something else. Right. One thing that's fundamentally scarce, maybe the most fundamentally scarce thing of all, is time, uh, where you can only be in one place at a time, and so if you want to do one thing, you kind of have to give up on every other possible thing uh, you could be doing at that moment. So for instance, if you're choosing um, which classes to take for a semester, and two things are scheduled at the same time, you kind of got to pick one. Um, or the other, you can't do both. So it's a trade-off. And um, we talk about trade-offs a lot in economics because uh, money is another thing um, that has a big trade-off, money and the, and the physical resources it represents. Um, so you often have to pick you know, one option or the other if you, uh, you can't afford both, right? I like this house, I like that house, I, I can't afford both houses, I got I to pick one. Um, so we're used to making all sorts of decisions and, and trade-offs like this in the real world as we go about our lives. Um, but when we think about uh, values, um, you sometimes also face trade-offs in, in values. Uh, so I think many, probably most people, are, are what we may call value pluralists, where there are, there are multiple things that you fundamentally value, um, which uh, might also mean uh, that you have multiple moral or eth ethical values uh, that can't simply be reduced to one, where, where one is just a, a version of the other. Um, now, not everybody think, thinks like this. Right? Um, you know, some people, especially you know, if, you, if you're taking ethics for the first time um, as a philosophy class, and you hear about utilitarianism, you want to you know, say, oh, it's all a utility. Everything can be reduced to a utility, uh, maybe especially if you are coming from a more economics type background. Um, but I think most people don't think this way. Um, so this colorful wheel you're, you're seeing here, um, this comes from a website called clearerthinking.org uh, where they tried to do these um, tests basically. Uh, you, can, you can take it yourself if you want at clearerthinking.org where um, they try to figure out what are the values uh, that people do value uh, intrinsically right, for their own sake. Uh, where I care about this thing um, not because I think it's going to get me something else, right? but because I care about it for itself. Right? Um, so money, I think, for most people would not be an intrinsic value. Right? Most people do place a big value on money, um, but only because you think it's going to get you these other things that you want. 
right? It's not that you want these green pieces of paper, right? It's you want the things uh, that you think they're going to be able to buy you. Um, but there are a lot of other things that are more fundamental values, um, and um, you can see some of those here. Right? Um, so two values um, that I think are often particularly important. One is uh, is freedom. It's I think upside down on the wheel here, so I don't know how well you can see it. Uh, but the, the autonomy, the ability to make um, decisions for yourself um, and not have other people make them for you. Um, that's something that a lot of people value intrinsically. Um, but it's one of many potential values you might have. Right? Um, happiness is another big value that people have. Uh, protection. Right? Um, and so there might be trade-offs between some of these values. Right? Um, sometimes if you want to get um, more happiness or more protection, uh, you might sometimes have to give up a little freedom. So that would be a trade-off. Um, so people might face these sorts of trade-offs all the time. Right? Um, importantly, uh, we might sometimes face them in, in healthcare, right? um, where there could be some sort of decision, um, especially in terms of government policy, right? where you could have one uh, policy where you let people do what they want, uh, give them autonomy, choice, or, or freedom, right? Um, or uh, you could try to make a choice for them, uh, where, you, where you might think, well, I'm doing this because I think it's gonna lead to better outcomes on average. Right? Um, for instance, right, um, this is what you might be trying to accomplish with a vaccine mandate, right? Where uh, we think you know, not everybody would, would do this left to themselves, right? Um, but the policymakers think, well, on average, uh, we think this is going to protect people, uh, not only themselves, but maybe protect them from spreading a disease to somebody else. Uh, so we'll just make them do it. Right? Um, and yes, that will impinge on a very real value, right? uh, freedom, autonomy, or choice. Um, but we, being in, in this case some policymakers, think uh, it's worthwhile um, because it will lead to these better consequences or outcomes in terms of fewer people dying and getting set, which is also very valuable. Right? Um, so a lot of times we, we do really face these, um, these trade-offs. Um, but uh, I do think we sometimes overstate the extent of these trade-offs, right? um, where I think much of the time we're taking away choices in healthcare um, in a way that you know, we're, we're violating some of these values um, uh, of freedom or autonomy or, or choice without necessarily getting much or anything back in, in the form of uh, better outcomes. So to go back to another um, basic principle of economics, right, uh, we often like to say um, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. And you might think, sure there is. I've, I've been to a free lunch. Right? Um, I, I ate some food and I didn't have to pay for it. Right? Um, what we usually mean by this, though, right, is you always have to pay something. Right? It's not always about money. Right? Uh, as an economist, I will tell you, yes, money is not the only thing that matters. It's usually not even the main thing that matters. Um, and usually you do have to pay with something for lunch. Right? Uh, you gotta pay with your time uh, while, you're, while you're at this uh, free, i.e. zero cost lunch, uh, zero money cost. Uh, you, you can't be in other places at the same time, so you're missing out on whatever you could be doing uh, elsewhere. Right? Um, and maybe that lunch is paired with like, I don't know, some really boring speaker. Um, so, so it's unpleasant. Um, and so that's what we mean, right? Usually, you know, usually there is no such thing as a free lunch. Um, but I will say, uh, sometimes there really is. Um, so yes, we live in this world of scarcity and, and tough choices and trade-offs um, much of the time. Uh, but sometimes you run into these choices that are in fact just really easy, um, where one alternative is, is way better than the others and you don't have to give up very much to do it. Uh, so for instance, uh, suppose there's this lunch where not only do you not have to pay money for it, uh, but the food's also amazing right? and the entertainment's great and there's nothing else happening that day, you're really not giving up much uh, of anything to be there. So that would be your, your true free lunch. Um, so I think those things do exist. Um, so you know, how does this apply in healthcare? Right? Um, so this, if you can recognize with the, uh, the slightly blurry, blurry picture, um, this is uh, US soccer player um, Kristen uh, Pulisic uh, getting a knee in the stomach and I think also kicked in the groin shortly after scoring a goal. Right? Um, colliding with the, um, the Iranian goalie. And um, that was a tough choice. Right? I think that's, that's our choice, right? Do I want to score this goal that's probably going to win us the game and help us advance to the next round? Or do I want to not get a uh, need in the stomach uh, in a way that might cause me a, a major injury? 
Um, so that's a tough trade-off. Um, and likewise, in healthcare, sometimes you do face these really tough trade-offs. Right? Um, you know, uh, for instance, you know, a surgeon deciding, do we need to amputate uh, this person's uh, leg right, or part of their limb? because they have this infection, this gangrene, that if we don't stop it, might um, spread and kill the whole patient. Right? That's a tough trade-off. Right? Um, do I want to do a certain damage now right, in the hope that it's going to prevent even more damage later? Um, that's, you know, there are these really tough uh, decisions. Right? At the same time, uh, sometimes the choices are, are easy. Right? Um, so that physician who has to make that difficult choice one time um, might really it might be the, might really be the right choice to amputate. Uh, at the same time, if you see this guy uh, and he says, "Trust me, I'm a doctor. I need to cut off everybody's legs here," right? um, I would say, uh, I, "I don't I don't think that's a good idea. I think that's a, a bad choice, and I think it's a pretty easy call uh, to say so." Right? Um, there's no trade-off. Nobody's going to die of gangrene. Um, cutting off everybody's legs would just be a pure bad for for no reason. Right? So let's not do that. So sometimes uh, there are easy choices. Okay, um, so bringing it back to healthcare policy, uh, which is mostly what I uh, study. Um, I see three major types of tools uh, that policymakers in the US like to use uh, when it comes to healthcare. Right? Um, there are bans uh, that tell people, uh, either patients or doctors, uh, you know, people in the healthcare system, uh, hey, you might want to do that, whatever that is, uh, but the government is saying uh, you can't. We think it's a bad idea. Uh, on the flip side, uh, maybe you don't want to do something, uh, but the government thinks it's, it's a very good idea. Uh, so they want to say, you must do that. Um, or um, you could do a subsidy, where you might not really want to do something, uh, but we'll sort of uh, pay you until you do, right? uh, either paying you directly or, or lower the price of it. Um, so I'll go through you know, each of these types of tools. Right? Um, so for bans, um, there are a lot of different versions of these, right? Some of these is uh, you can't practice medicine uh, without a license, right? Uh, government approval. Uh, if you want to open a new healthcare facility in the U.S. in most states, um, you need a certain type of government approval uh, called a certif certificate uh, of need. And if you want to sell medicine, uh, you can't do that without approval. Uh, you need um, approval from the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And um, for the most part, I think people get really used to this. The middle one, you, you might not have heard of um, before today, right? But I think the, the, um, the license to practice medicine and the FDA approval for um, medications, uh, these have been around so long um, that I think people assume it just has to work this way and it's obviously better this way. And um, I'm not even really gonna argue against that today, right? Um, you know, if you wanna look it up, um, some economists, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, 70 years ago, he was arguing uh, that you don't need uh, medical licensing. Uh, yeah. um, we'd be you know, fine or maybe better without it. Uh, I don't want to make that argument today, um, but I will try to make the, um, the weaker argument, the weaker related argument, uh, that our current licensing regime in medicine is um, sort of unusually and perhaps unnecessarily strict. Um, so if you look here, uh, you can see the typical uh, number of years of school that you need to go to uh, before you can practice medicine. Um, and on the, the far right here, we have Canada and the US uh, being the two countries that are uh, typically gonna require eight years of school, right, i.e. four years of undergraduate training and four years of medical school uh, before you can practice medicine. Um, and that's unusually high, right? In many countries, uh, you can go straight to medical school, um, which might be four or perhaps five years. Um, one way or another, you're able to practice medicine with substantially less training um, than you would require here. And as a result, uh, they tend to have more doctors. So the, the horizontal axis here is how many years, the vertical axis is basically how many doctors do you have per capita. Um, so you can see we've, we are um, unusually low on the number of doctors we have um, per, uh, per capita, and unusually high on the amount of uh, training required, and I think these two are, are related. Right? And um, might be a little hard to see here, but you can see a lot of these countries uh, where you can become a doctor more quickly. These are developed countries with very successful uh, medical systems uh, where on average people live longer than they do here. Um, countries like uh, the United Kingdom, Italy, Germany, Japan, and so on. Um, so continuing with some of these international comparisons, um, this is some data from the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, um, which tracks the data on most of these um, sort of uh, rich developed countries, about 30, 35 of them, 
and this is the number of new uh, medical graduates uh, per capita per year in each of these countries. Right? So how many new people are, are finishing medical school and getting out there um, being you know, now allowed to go practice medicine, treat patients. Um, and you can see we are uh, very much at the low end here. The, the US is highlighted in red. Um, and so at least, again, by the standards of, of rich countries, um, we are not graduating very many uh, physicians. And I think that's related to the fact that you just saw that, well, it's, it's this long and arduous road to get there. Uh, you're gonna have to go to school for a long time. Even so, a lot of people wanna do that. Um, there's, there's plenty of people who still want to go to school for eight years um, and train even beyond that so they can be a doctor in the United States. Uh, but there's only a limited number of spots these, in these medical schools, and we have relatively few spots per capita uh, where students are allowed to go study. Um, and at the level of med school, why do they have so few spots? Right? Well, if you want to open a med school or expand your medical school, you're going to need to get permission from the relevant authorities, like the American Association of Medical Colleges, to be allowed to do so. Um, and they tend to think, like, well, there are plenty of spots as is, right? um, where if you're running one of these schools, you kind of don't want more competition. You want all the students to just um, come to you and so you can get the best ones. Right? Um, and partly as a result of this limited number of, of spots for medical schools here and the long training, uh, we also have relatively, relatively few uh, practicing phys physicians uh, per capita in the US. Um, as you can see, we're not quite as bad off here. Right? We're not uh, quite as far to the left in terms of uh, few physicians per capita. Um, and that's because we make up for our quite low numbers of new medical students um, with a relatively high rate of immigration. Right? Uh, there are lots of doctors all over the world who would love to come to the United States and practice medicine, and uh, many of them do come here, um, but there are a lot more who would like to uh, who aren't allowed to. Uh, partly that's due to um, immigration restrictions, right, where they simply can't come here. Um, but part of it is that even once they're here, um, we require doctors from every country in the world except for Canada um, to redo their residency training once they're here. Right? So if you want to become a doctor in the US, uh, like I said, it's this very hard, uh, arduous road. Um, it's not just um, passing these classes uh, like organic, organic chemistry, finishing your undergraduate degree, going through four years of med medical school. Uh, even once you do all that and you've run that gauntlet, you got one of those coveted, hard to get spots in medical school, um, you still can't practice medicine on your own just because you have an MD. Uh, you need to do further training uh, in an, as a resident doctor, basically like an apprentice doctor. Um, and those res residencies um, run about three to six years depending on what field you're in. Right? Um, but if you, so, you know, new medical students here have to do those, right? Um, other countries often have some version of this um, that you might have gone through there. Um, but again, if you came from any country except Canada, we're going to require that you redo uh, that training here. Right? Even if you've been a successful doctor in some other country for 10 or 20 years, um, and even if that's a country, um, and there are many of them, where uh, the average life expectancy is, is higher than that of the United States. Right? Um, you've got to redo it to, uh, to our standards, um, which in some ways are high. Right? Like we, we do have uh, longer medical training programs than these other countries. Um, but I would say that you know, all else equal, those, those high standards sound great. Of course, you want to see a doctor who has high, went through high standards with lots of training. Um, and I agree right? um, that that is ideal. Right? Uh, but oftentimes, um, again, to make a classic economic point, right, the alternative to, to um, perfection right, um, could be something that's pretty good. Right? Unless you make it, there would be no alternative. Right? Uh, so with doctors, right, if you can find a doctor here, they're probably going to be pretty good. They're, they're well trained. They've certainly got a lot of training. Uh, but you, not, you might simply not be able to find one because there aren't that many of them around. Um, when I moved to Rhode Island two years ago and uh, tried to get a new uh, family doctor reestablished care, uh, it took me 12 calls. Uh, and I was only calling doctors who were already on this list that my insurance company had told me were, were taking new patients. Um, but a lot of them either wouldn't pick up the phone or they'd pick up the phone and say, oh, no, we're not actually taking new patients. Um, and then on the 12th call, I finally heard from somebody who said, um, oh, yeah, I can see you in three months. Right? And I'm sure uh, a lot of you have your own stories like this right? or, or have heard them. Um, and I think that's simply because we don't have enough uh, doctors uh, to go around. Right. Um, so, you know, it's certainly common um, that 
people might look with suspicion right, on, on people from other countries. I don't want to say it's a good thing, right? but it's, a, it's, it's certainly a common thing. Uh, what really surprises me, though, right, um, is the extent to which uh, even US states will try to keep out doctors not only from other countries, um, but also from other states, um, where, for the most part, um, at least historically, states didn't recognize licenses from other states. Right? You, at the very least, you're going to have to redo the licensing proce process each time you move to a new state and, and want to work there. Um, this is starting to change with things like the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, uh, where you would have uh, recognition across states. There were also a lot of temporary waivers during COVID, um, where New York would say, you know, for instance, like, okay, we don't normally want doctors from other states to work here, but hey, this is, this is a pandemic crisis emergency. Come and work here at least for a few weeks. Um, uh, California, interestingly, not yet a, a signatory to this. But. Um, so why do, why do they do all this? Right. Again, um, part of it could be about trying to have these very high standards um, where you know, we're only going to allow, allow people to practice medicine if, if, if they train for a very long time, and we want to try to protect patients um, from seeing uh, practitioners who might not be as good, um, even if they might want to. Right? They might you know, rather see somebody with some training rather than not see anybody at all. Okay. Um, but I do think, right, a lot of these laws, um, they're passed by people who think they're, they're doing the right thing to, to uh, improve patient care. Uh, at the same time, it's also pretty clear that, that physician salaries in the US are incredibly high right, and unusually high. Right? Um, doctors tend to make a lot more than the average person in every country, um, but here uh, the gap is particularly large. Right? Um, and so you can see here, um, First of all, even the low-paid fields in medicine, uh, where the doctors will complain about how they make so much less uh, than um, the doctors in other fields, they, they still make incredibly high uh, salaries. Um, where being in, the, in under 200,000 means, oh, you're in one of the low-paid uh, professions. Um, you can tell it's a very high-paid field. Um, but even within medicine in the US, right, where um, even the pediatricians and, and family medicine doctors are, are pretty well off, uh, you can see that these um, some of these fields that have longer or more competitive training have even higher pay. Right? Um, so the, the very highest paid doctors in the US uh, are in specialties like orthopedics or cardiology. Um, and this is where you have some of the, some of the longest training. Uh, so family medicine, you might be able to, to get into practice with just three years of, of training after uh, medical school. Uh, some of these others though, um, it's gonna take five or six years of training in terms of residencies and, and fellowships before you can practice orthopedics or, or cardi cardiology. And on top of that, um, you might not be allowed to pursue that training in, training in the first place um, because there's only a limited number of spots for these resident physicians, apprentice physicians. Um, and in these high paid fields, right, um, there are a lot more doctors who want to do them um, than there are spots to, to train those doctors. Um, and so as an economist, I have to at least wonder um, if part of the reason we have such uh, strict rules uh, and long training requirements um, is to support a system like this, right, where there aren't very many doctors around, um, and so the ones we do have are desperately wanted, right, and um, people become willing to pay very high prices um, for those relatively scarce um, physicians. Right? Um, and certainly lobbying efforts by the American Medical Association uh, did help get us you know, a lot of these policies in the first place. Uh, at the same time, you know, I don't want to be too hard on, on doctors, um, for one, I'm, I'm married to one, right? uh, but, but for two, the um, almost no individual physician around helped create this system. Right? And many of them don't even like it. Right? Um, because the very fact, uh, the very things that drive these high salaries for physicians, like the scarcity of, of physicians out there, um, that's the same reason that physicians you see, they're so overworked and so busy. Um, and I was always complaining about, oh, I have way too many patients, I have too much to do. To do. Um, and they're right, right? Um, I think, you know, they're not just whining in this case, right? Complaining about a salary of 180,000, okay, maybe that's kind of whining, right? But complaining about the workload, um, I don't blame them at all. Uh, the workload is very high. Um, a typical doctor is, is working uh, 40, 45 to 50 hours a week, um, and many of them are working much more than that. Um, uh, my brother, who just finished his uh, family medicine residency, it was, it was one of these trainings where you're working 80 hours a week for, for three years. Um, and even that is, a, is a, a, an improvement. Uh, the federal government 
um, another ban here, uh, again, uh, an understandable one, um, is they, they ban residents from working more than 80 hours a week. Uh, and they had to do this ban because a lot of them were. Um, in fact, a lot of them still are and are being forced to, to circumvent the 80 hour a week um, maximum uh, limit on, on their working. Right? Um, but again, I think part, part of the reason they are so overworked uh, is because there's such huge demand for doctors and uh, not enough doctors to go around because we have uh, relatively few spots to train them. All right, so that's doctors. Um, on the facility level, right? Um, this is not a, a federal law um, anymore, um, but it's a law that most states have, where if you want to open uh, or expand your hospital, your nursing home, uh, many types of health healthcare facility, you need to get approval uh, from the state board um, called a certificate of need board or cert certificate of need approval. Um, there's a lot of variation from, from states to state, state to state, even the states that do have them about which types of facilities uh, require these. In general, uh, the things they most often target are hospitals and nursing homes. Um, but sometimes you'll also see these on, on medical offices, uh, on um, expensive equipment like MRI machines, or on hospitals entering new lines of service, right? like if you want to start doing neonatology, heart surgery, radiation, when you haven't before, you might also require a separate uh, approval like this. <coughs> um, and I think part of the idea here right, is um, most of these were, were passed. The federal government pushed these in the 1970s. Uh, they said, states, you need to set up a system like this or we're going to cut your Medicare funding. Um, and I think the worry was, uh, like our previous speaker said, that um, if you build out these new hospitals, oh, they're just going to fill them. Right? They'll find a way to get people in those beds and, and charge Medicare uh, money for it. After some reforms to the Medicare program in the early 1980s, I think the federal government was no longer so worried about this, um, and they no longer um, sort of threatened to withhold Medicare funds from states uh, that don't do this. Um, and so they left it up to states, hey, if you want to repeal your board, go ahead. And in fact, we would prefer if you do, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice now see these laws as anti-competitive um, and ask states to repeal them. Um, it would certainly be illegal for uh, private competitors to set up a system like this, uh, but because of the state action doctrine, they can't actually make the state stop, but they just have to say, hey, pretty please, we, we think this is anti-competitive and it's hurting patients. Uh, could you please repeal these laws? And for the most part, the states stay uh, no. Um, the, again, the proponents of these systems hoped uh, it would uh, restrain spending um, and improve the quality of care. Uh, the research on this tends to find that that's not true. Um, and uh, some of my papers find that uh, the states that have these, uh, they actually spend more. Uh, again, you have fewer hospitals, so you're, you are treating fewer people. Uh, but you can charge, you can and, and they tend to, charge a higher price to the people there. Right? Again, when you, when you sort of make it harder to build, um, there's less competition, there's a lower supply. Uh, the existing providers um, can and, and usually do charge higher prices as a result. Okay. Um, and now here's drugs. Right? And, and again, you might say, of course you need the FDA to, to approve drugs. Right? Um, and there are these horror stories about um, what happened um, in the world before the FDA. Uh, where uh, companies would sell these uh, you know, patent medicines where at best you don't know what they're doing and it's probably nothing, right? um, or at worst, uh, they would have uh, horrific side effects. Right? Uh, and so that's part of why we got the FDA uh, in the first place uh, through the 1906 uh, Pure Food and Drug Act, and um, that's part of why their, their authority was expanded in 1938 um, to require pre-market approval um, and uh, police safety. Um, so since 1938, if you want to sell a new medicine in the United States, uh, before you're allowed to sell your, your first pill, you need uh, to get approval from the FDA that says, hey, we think this is safe. In 1962, uh, the harris Kefauver Act expanded the FDA's powers to say, okay, now uh, we're going to require uh, that medicines sold in the United States be uh, certified by the FDA as effective as well as safe. Uh, it turns out um, it's much more costly and time consuming to prove effectiveness than it is to, to only prove safety. And um, since we have started requiring um, uh, drugs to do that, we get a lot fewer new approved drugs each year. Right? Um, now, how many of these drugs are we losing because they weren't effective? Right? And how many of these drugs were we losing because uh, they maybe were effective, but it was just going to be too uh, time-consuming and expensive to prove it. Uh, that's, that's the hard thing to say. But we are certainly losing drugs. Um, so here's a, 
you know, quick uh, summary of the, uh, the drug pipeline, where if you want to try to figure out uh, a new drug to treat a, a, a disease, it's a very hard process, right? Um, doing, uh, you know, finding effective and safe pharmaceuticals is very difficult. Uh, a company might screen literally thousands of these to, to find one drug uh, that's able to get um, approved to be sold. And they go through all these different stages. You, you test it in the lab, in a Petri dish. Um, sometimes now, like in silico, you try to figure out things on a computer before you even do that. Um, and that knocks out the vast majority of drugs. Um, after that, you'll have some candidates uh, where they might start doing animal testing, like on mice, uh, then larger animals. And if things are still working um, years into the process, you'll finally try giving it to a person right? um, uh, to figure out, hey, is this safe? Then a larger group of people to figure out, is this safe? Um, uh, and then you try to try to do these uh, effectiveness trials, which tend to be the largest um, and most expensive at all. Uh, so it's a long process. And it kind of, to some extent, it has to be a long process, right? Science is hard. Figuring out things that work is hard. Proving that they work is is hard. Uh, at the same time, again, um, much of this is either inevitable or or advisable, um, but not not all of it is. Um, so all drugs that are going to be sold in, in the United States, they need to be approved by the FDA. In the FDA, they're going to take some time to review all the research done by these pharmaceutical companies to figure out, hey, is, is this drug good enough? Is it safe and effective enough that we'll approve it and allow doctors to prescribe it and allow patients to use their judgment about whether they want to use it? Uh, so how long does it take the FDA to do that? Uh, that's varied a lot, not only over time, uh, but from division to division. Um, so this is a chart from a paper by uh, Alex Tabarrok, uh, where he got data uh, about average approval times by division uh, in the FDA. And you can see um, there are these uh, more than threefold differences, uh, where some divisions, they're just either more careful or, or more inefficient, <laughs> uh, again, depending on how you want to think about it, uh, where they'll take much longer, right? sometimes as much as two years to, on average to review uh, all the research that a pharma company's already, already done. Uh, while others uh, can reliably do so in substantially less than a year. <clears throat> and uh, drug companies, uh, research companies, they notice this. Um, so this is a, a, a chart from um, one of my papers uh, published uh, in 2020 in the Journal of Health, in, in the journal Health Economics, um, where we took uh, data from the early 2000s right, and figured out what were uh, drugs that took a very long time to, to get approved um, and you can see some of these individual drugs um, took over a thousand days, right? so basically three years uh, to get fully approved. Right? So um, remember those divisions that were taking six or seven hundred days, those were averages. So some of those drugs uh, would be held up uh, much longer, um, while others uh, were reviewed incredibly quickly. Uh, the average review time um, during our data was, was 466 days. Uh, but again, there's a lot of variation by division and by type of drug. Um, and so the test we did was to say, okay, let's get data on the pipeline of new drugs who are somewhere in this process of being screened by pharma companies, tested through trials to see if they work, um, and see are we seeing more new drugs in the, um, in the types of categories that, that are reviewed quickly by the FDA, fewer new drugs than the ones that the FDA tends to take a long time on. And we could very much see that um, where on average, um, including we're not just doing a scatter plot analysis, doing a regression where we control for all sorts of things. You can see that on average, um, taking 78 extra days um, to review drugs in a certain category tends to lead to you know, one fewer drug in the pipeline in that category uh, during, the, um, during that time. Okay, so um, you're gonna need approval if you wanna sell a drug, open a facility, practice medicine, right? And uh, this approval, in many cases is incredibly time consuming and, and stringent. <clears throat> um, one final example of this, uh, during COVID, right, um, again, if we think back to the early days of, of 2020, right, um, in January uh, and February 2020, uh, first, well, first in January, um, you're, you're hearing about, oh, this is just some problem in other countries, right? Uh, and people would say like, oh, uh, that's interesting, right? Um, it's only in China. Uh, now it's only in China and Iran and Italy. It, you know, it's not something we have to worry about here. It's not going to make it here, right? Um, by February, uh, people are re realizing like, oh, um, maybe it is making it here, but only from people who traveled to one of those countries, right? There's no community spread here. Um, and part of the reason we thought there was no community spread is we, we weren't doing tests. Uh, now, partly it's, it, was, it was because it was a very new thing. It's hard to manufacture these, these new tests. 
Um, but in large part, it's because the FDA didn't want to allow people to test. <coughs> um, the, um, they said, well, any new test, it's a new product, basically, that we need to, to approve. Um, so even though the World Health Organization has created you know, the first effective test for, for COVID very quickly in very early 2020, um, we're not going to allow doctors here to use that, right? even though they might think it's a good idea, even though the World Health Organization, uh, which presumably knows something about all this stuff, thinks it's a good idea. Uh, we, the FDA, don't. Um, and as a result, using any of those tests is illegal here. <clears throat> the one test, uh, the first test they allowed, uh, was created by the CDC, turned out uh, to be faulty. Um, and partly as a result of this, there were, there were probably several weeks of, of community spread early on in the United States in, in February 2020. Um, but it wasn't until February 25th when this was finally confirmed, um, not by one of these CDC tests, um, but by uh, Dr. Helen Chu at the University of Washington, um, who said, hey, forget all this. Right? I'm going to use my own test that I created in my own lab that I've been running to, to study the flu um, and confirm uh, the first case of community spread in the US, i.e. Right? somebody being infected with COVID from somebody else in the US, uh, and the, uh, somebody who hadn't, um, and they hadn't themselves traveled abroad to a country where um, COVID was known to be spreading. Um, as brave as she was to defy the FDA and do this, uh, she has said that she would have done the test two weeks earlier if it hadn't been for the whole FDA rule, right? It took her a while to sort of work up the nerve and realize like, oh, the FDA, they're just not gonna let me do this. Um, and I think that, that was a very crucial two weeks um, where you, you sort of eliminated any realistic shot we have of uh, doing something like the New Zealand strategy where, you know, you just, any, anytime somebody has COVID, um, you just find, you know, do, do tests all around them, find everybody with COVID um, and uh, sort of test, trace, isolate, and um, then you won't have any spread. Right? Um, now, maybe that was never gonna work, right? But if it was gonna work, um, we had to be able to find those cases very early and we didn't. Um, and I think this restriction on being allowed to, to, um, to do any tests but those approved by the FDA was, was part of this. <clears throat> um, since then, um, we've seen dramatic changes right, uh, with the FDA allowing these uh, at-home tests, right, which is great. This is not something they usually do. It was a big breakthrough when home pregnancy tests were allowed. Right? It used to be, um, again, because of regulatory reasons, uh, that you would have to see a doctor to take a pregnancy test uh, until the FDA changed their mind there. Right? So that was. There, there are some big examples of the FDA increasing uh, the amount of autonomy over time, removing some bans, uh, like a ban on home pregnancy tests or, or home COVID tests. And I think the results in those cases have been quite good. <clears throat> and you know, likewise, with, uh, with COVID treatments, uh, there were a lot of things that, that might have been uh, promising early uh, that took a while for people uh, to be allowed to use. Um, to me, the vaccines are, are the biggest one, where um, uh, Moderna, they developed their, their vaccine with um, incredible speed um, based on, um, uh, I think, computer data uh, that people had sent from China about the makeup of the virus. Uh, so they, they had a prototype vaccine by February 2020. Um, people weren't allowed to use this until um, December 2020 at the earliest. Um, which is still incredibly fast by the standards of the FDA, right? Um, but I think things could have gone much, much faster there, again, at a very crucial time. Um, but we wanted to finish the trials first, right? And again, to some extent, I think that's, that's advisable, right? Uh, you want to know that these things are, are safe and effective. Um, but despite the fact that they did go much faster than usual, right, I, I think there were a lot of, a lot of uh, things that slowed uh, the release of those uh, trials down. Um, I was actually in one of these trials, um, because I had read the evidence and I, I was listening to um, a lot of the, uh, the experts and, uh, and they seemed pretty confident uh, that a few of these vaccines were going to be pretty good. Um, a lot of them seemed to think that the, uh, the Novavax one was, was likely to be the best uh, in terms of safety for sure and possibly effectiveness. Um, so I was like, oh, that's great. I want that. Um, but I couldn't get it because the FDA was saying like, uh, well, it's not approved, right? So they're not allowed to sell it to you. Uh, you're at the very least gonna pay huge fines, right? If you try to sell this to people and, and you know, probably find some way to put you in jail um, for selling what turns out to be very safe and effective um, medication. Um, and so since I wasn't allowed to buy the Novavax vaccine, I thought, okay, I'll do the next best thing. Uh, I'll, I'll sign up for the trial. I'm not allowed to pay with this for money. The FDA doesn't approve of that, um, but they, they will let me be in the trial. And 
Um, in, in some ways, it's a great experience, right? Like, okay, I got this, uh, what turned out to be a very effective medication much earlier than I otherwise would have been allowed to, right? Um, this was at a time in late 2020 where most groups of people uh, were not yet allowed to get the approved vaccines. <clears throat> and so I'm kind of worried about COVID and I think, okay, uh, what am I gonna do here? Uh, you know, Again, the only choice uh, that seemed to be left to me to get access um, to what I thought uh, what turned out to be correctly uh, was gonna be a very safe and effective medication was to enroll in this trial. I would much rather have just paid with my money though. Right? They were paying me, uh, that was cool, I got a few hundred dollars for participating in this clinical trial. Um, but I would much rather have been paying them. So why? Um, because to do these trials, to test safety and effectiveness, they draw your blood. And maybe for some of you, that's not a big deal, right? And if so, maybe you should do some of these trials. They, they sometimes they, they pay pretty well. Um, but again, I hated it. I would much rather um, not have the money. I'd, I want to give them the money if I can get the effective medication without the blood draws. Um, but instead, they made me pay in, in blood. Um, so I, I, maybe some of this is personal, but. Um, <laughs> All right, so th those are the bands. Uh, there are all sorts of things. Oh, am I um, 40 minutes in already? All right, all right I'll speed up though. Um, so those are the bands. Um, mandates, uh, there are also all sorts of, of mandates where the government wants people to do more of something and so they just say, well, you have to. Uh, employers, large employers need to offer health insurance or, or pay a $2,000 per employee fine. Uh, for a while, um, we had the individual mandate from the Affordable Care Act telling you, hey, you have to have insurance or you're gonna be fined. Um, health, the health insurers have all sorts of uh, mandates on them where states tell them, hey, you need to cover X, Y, and Z right, if you're gonna offer a health insurance plan. Uh, we tell doctors all sorts of things about what they have to do. Uh, one fairly recent one, um, again, with the Affordable Care Act is telling them, hey, you have to use electronic medical records even if, you know, in your judgment, you think paper's better. Um, and ask any doctor you know about electronic medical records, right? In theory, it's a great idea, but in practice, for some reason, uh, they, they can't make good software for these. I, I honestly don't know why they're so bad, um, but the doctors do tend to hate them right? um, and vaccine mandates. Okay. And then finally, we have these subsidies, right? where um, there's sort of two tracks here. Right, One is, is the programs that the government runs themselves, uh, like Medicare and Medicaid, uh, that pay for large fractions of care. Um, and then there's also all the ways where uh, you sort of push people to get private insurance, which then kind of subsidize some of, the, some of their treatment. Right? Um, so since 1916 in the US, our average healthcare spending per person uh, has gone up about nine times, and that's in real inflation-adjusted terms. Uh, and the mix of it has also changed substantially um, away from out-of-pocket costs, right, uh, which used to be about half of all spending, uh, where now the vast majority of everything is covered by insurance, um, and almost half of the spending is done through government insurance. Right? A little half, a little less than half, if you look at what directly comes from the government, um, and a little more uh, if you're counting things like uh, the, exchange, the subsidized individual plans on the exchanges or the tax deduct deductibility offered to uh, employer-based health insurance. Okay. One concern that e economists and actuaries bring up about all this right, is that when people are only paying 11% uh, for 11% of their care directly out of pocket, um, they're gonna use more care than they otherwise would. Uh, the term uh, that the actuaries came up with this uh, for this is, is moral hazard, right? uh, where you know, if people don't pay the full price, they'll use more. Um, I think of this as the buffet effect, right? Like. Um, you know, most people, certainly me, if you go to a buffet, you're gonna eat more food than you do at a regular restaurant. Because at a regular restaurant, every time you order more food, you pay more money. Whereas for a buffet, you pay once up front, um, and then you, know, you, you eat all, all you want. Um, and health insurance is, is mostly like this. You pay one big premium up front, and then you pay usually a, a sometimes no price, usually a heavily subsidized price uh, for everything else. Um, so the term moral, it's weird, it's kind of weird to me that, that this shows up here. Right? Who, are, who are the accountants, the, um, the actuaries to be saying what's moral, what's immoral? Um, now economists, we have borrowed the term um, uh, from actuaries who probably thought, hey, this is immoral, uh, because that people are, are using this extra care and it's costing the insurance companies more money. Um, and the economists, I think typically we don't think that there's, there's something immoral about this. We just think, oh, well, people, they're responding to incentives. If you lower the price, people are gonna use more of something. That demand curve slope downwards. That's like core economics. So we don't normally like blame people for making these decisions. Um, but at the same time, it, it is true that when people use more care as a result of these sort of subsidized prices, because you're only paying 11 cents on the dollar on average, um, they are gonna use up scarce resources like um, medical uh, medications, hospital beds, or, or doctor's time. So I think it is an interesting uh, question. Uh, but overall, 
I think the tendency we see here uh, is for government policy to subsidize the demand side, uh, tell people, hey, use more care. Um, we'll pay for some of it. Maybe sometimes we'll tell you you, ha you have to do it. Uh, there's a mandate there. Uh, these things tend to increase the demand for care. Right? So use more care. Um, so people do. Um, and the, but this also tends to drive up the prices, right? um, at least the, the total price paid, right? although, the, although sometimes the patient's share uh, might actually go down. Um, on the flip side, the, the bans telling people you can't do this, you can't do that, uh, that tends to reduce the supply of healthcare. Right? Uh, hey, you can't practice medicine, you gotta train for a lot more years, you can't open this hospital you wanna open, uh, even though you, know, you think there's a market for it. I don't think that, or I don't want the competition, so you, you can't open that. Um, you know, it's, you're gonna need 10, 10 years and billion dollars to get that drug to market, uh, and so on. Uh, so there's reduced supply. Right. Overall, that means less care is available, um, and that providers uh, can charge more care, um, uh, more for w w what um, what there is well, when there's not much available and not much competition for it. Um, so you might notice, right, um, the cutting the cutting back on um, supply, the increasing demand, um, those push the quantity of care that people use in opposite directions. So they at least roughly are going to cancel out, but both of them are things that push prices higher. Um, and so I think that's what we see. Right. In the U.S., we see that people use, for the most part, a pretty average amount of care um, by the developed country standards, uh, but we pay much higher prices. Uh, there's a famous uh, article um, in Health Affairs uh, from um, called It's the Price is Stupid that, that makes this argument. Um, and, and again, like you saw in the last talk, I think you can see some of this in the data uh, where the U.S. Uh, has become a big outlier in terms of spending by far the most um, on health care per person per year um, while having uh, life expectancy um, I used to say that's average at best for, for rich countries, but now um, we're really at the bottom of the pack for, for rich uh, developed countries. And what really kind of bugs me is, is that we're getting worse. Um, so life expectancy in the, in the United States peaked in, in 2014, right? So COVID, yeah, that, that kind of came out of nowhere, right? It, it, it's, it's sort of excusable, I think, that that dropped life expectancy. It's dropping life expectancy everywhere. Um, but our life, uh, and, and it brought the sharpest decline, but you were actually seeing a slight decline in U.S. life expectancy even before that, um, partly because of um, the op opioid epidemic. Uh, anyway, um, in conclusion, right, um, we have all these restrictions on freedom, autonomy, and choice, right? Um, and they might at least arguably justifiable if they were leading to great outcomes. Um, in the aggregate, though, they aren't. Uh, we have you know, this, this high, um, incredibly high spending per capita, uh, with a fairly low um, life expectancy per capita. Now, of course, right, it is logically possible that things would be even worse uh, without all of these bans or subsidies or mandates. Um, and in some cases, I think this is in fact true. Right? Um, the vaccine subsidies through Operation Warp Speed seemed like they were an effectively effective, incredibly effective um, use of money at, at increasing U.S. life expectancy. But uh, as a whole, um, we don't appear to be getting great outcome gains uh, by trading away our freedom. Um, and in some cases, we might actually be getting worse outcomes uh, by doing so. Um, I could see more, but I'm already over time, so I'll uh, keep it there and, and look forward to your questions. We'll now hear from our formal respondents. Uh, Dr. Bailey will have an opportunity to reply to each and then we'll open the floor up to you, our audience, for questions. Hannah? Thank you. Um, first and foremost, thank you for the very um, thoughtful um, talk and beautiful presentation that was really easy to follow along with. Um, the first question I have for you is um, you made the point clear that we want to subsidize um, demand while restricting supply. So what, um, forgive me if you've covered this, but what are some like examples we can, or what are things we can provide our, um, our residents without really taking away from a restricted supply? Um, great question, yeah, so with, with all these questions about policy, right, there's sort of what you would do in your ideal world, right, and you say, well, we just don't, don't restrict don't restrict supply, right? Uh, then there would be plenty for everybody. Um, uh, but yeah, there are all sorts of actors in a system where you can change some things, but you can't change everything, um, and it is hard to do. Um, to some extent, um, I know this is hard to do, right? But you, you, you can try to think, right? Um, 
and again, especially I'm an economist, I think you know, people tend to do what's in their own rational self-interest, right? But you can try to think about, you know, uh, what does all this mean for everybody else, uh, you know, as a doctor or as, as, as a patient? Right? Um, again, like I've definitely done the moral hazard thing, right? Um, where I'm, I sort of I have some allergies, they're not that bad, but I was kind of curious, okay, what exactly am I allergic to? Oh, my, my doctor gave me a referral to go see this allergist, and he'll do a test, and he tell me what I'm allergic to. That's kind of cool. Um, and the copay, it's just 50 bucks, so yeah, I guess I'll do it. Um, and later I get the bill, right? And they only charged me $50, but they charged my insurance company um, $1,100, right? And I thought, oh, that's kind of crazy. Um, I was, and then I kind of think, like, oh, I'm using up this allergist's time, right? Um, and I don't really need to know this stuff, right? I don't have life-threatening allergies. Some people do. Should I have even done that, <laughs> right? Um, and used up $1,100 of the, the insurance company's money. Um, but I don't know. They don't, even, like, they don't even tell you up front, you know, what, what is everybody else going to pay? Um, so it, it is hard to ask people to, to decide differently, um, but it would be nice. Right? Um, likewise, doctors you know, are facing similar issues um, where hey, the more I do, the more I'm going to get paid. Most, you know, most doctors work in a fee-for-service system. You've got to do more to get paid. Um, you can try to fight a little against those incentives, but it, but it is very hard. Thank you. Um, if I may, another question I have is, or I should say this is more of a proposal. Um, I recall you um, mentioning earlier how we can um, try like, like convincing more customers to use these services and how earlier you described how sometimes um, we try to um, lean, more, lean towards digital um, forms and stuff, for example, instead of like paper, but we are we're having difficulties. Um, are there ways we can like maybe communicate this to the, um, the community more in terms of like maybe having web designers and the medical industry working together to like get that out there better? Or, or? Yeah, I, I honestly don't know what the solution is uh, with the medical records. I know one thing they're, they're fighting against is there are all these privacy requirements right, uh, with, with HIPAA um, and you need to design a system around that. Right? Um, and so, you know, as a patient, you, you probably want interoperability. Like, wouldn't it be cool if I could go to my doctor and I'd go to the hospital, and the hospital would already know what my doctor knows, um, and I don't have to like re-enter everything every time I go to a different place, or even go back to the same place. Um, that would be nice. You know, some of that is hindered by privacy requirements, but I think there's still a lot of room for improvement purely on the software side. Um, uh, to go back to the the whole competition angle, I think part of it is is a lack of, of competition. There are just a few big companies here. Um, at the same time, a lot of what I hear from doctors is like, well, yeah, Epic has the most market share because even though they're bad, everybody else is, has a worse product. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, hopefully some you know, brilliant software person out there, um, maybe in nearby Silicon Valley, will, will figure out how to make a good uh, interface and, and roll that out. Uh, one other big digital trend recently, of course, has, has been telemedicine, um, which COVID really expanded uh, for a couple different reasons, right? One, you didn't want to be in person. Um, but two, um, there were all these temporary waivers of a lot of the rules uh, around telemedicine where you know, Medicare would start paying for it when they might previously not have. Um, states would let you see a doctor in another state <laughs> and uh, not worry about, oh, they have a license from a different state. Um, and one big question right now, I think, is how much of that is gonna be able to stick around post-COVID um, where you know, a lot of people really liked having telemedicine be more available, uh, especially in certain fields like psychiatry. Um, and I think some of that is going away now where states are bringing back their restrictions about seeing a doctor in another state. Um, but hopefully some of that will survive. Thank you. And my final question to you is on a personal, like uh, in your opinion, do you think the bans and subsidiaries um, that are being accommodated right now, are they going in a positive direction or like can they use more improvement or are they going in the, in the right way? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, Probably case by case, uh, there's a big mix. Um, the trend in certificate of need has been to walk these back a little bit, um, although it's slow going. Um, you know, with COVID, we had s even there was a mix, right? Obviously, there was a whole slew of new new bans um, in, in ways that were previously unimaginable, some new bans and mandates. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of these previous rules um, were waived um, about um, doctors working in different states. Um, a lot of the certificate of need requirements were temporarily waived where people realized, like, oh, our hospitals are full. Maybe we should let them add beds right away instead of having them go through a six-month process where they need to pay $100,000 to get permission to add more beds. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, it's been 
just so different in the, in the different areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a fantastic talk, and I have a whole lot of questions, but I think I'll restrain myself to just a couple. Um, I guess maybe first, I think you talked a lot about sort of the balancing act that a policy might, maker might need to, to, to have to sort of in implementing any of these policies. And, and maybe I'll just ask you specifically about the FDA, because I think it's often easier to think in specifics. I think we probably could all agree that the FDA exists for a good reason and, and should have some kind of review. Um, but I think you also argued that perhaps the bureaucracy is, is harmful. So where would you draw that line? If you're sort of thinking about where to place lines between effectiveness and safety, could you do a safety review first and effectiveness post-market or something? I have yeah. to say, we've been trying that, and I'm not sure it's so effective. So I'm wondering if you could wave your, your, your wand. Where would you think yeah. about drawing that, those lines? That, that's exactly where I was going to go. Um, so there's sort of the easy thing, right, which is, well, have them hire more people so they can do faster reviews. And again, we've been doing some of that since the 1990s. Um, where um, you know, the pharma pharmaceutical companies will pay bigger fees so the FDA can hire more people so they can review things faster. Um, yeah, that's sort of the easy win, right? Uh, get some of these slower parts of the FDA to work more like the faster parts of the FDA. But yeah, the, the more possibly controversial thing, right, I think would be to get partial approval of drugs after phase two trials, right, where you show that they're safe um, and wait for full approval uh, after you do finish the phase three trials. How I imagine this might work uh, is that um, approval for, for people to buy this if they want with their own money right, happens after phase two, um, but phase three trials and full standard FDA approval are required for um, insurance company approval. Right? Um, so you know, hey, if you're gonna use other people's money and if you're gonna sort of do the thing where that gets the vast majority of drugs paid for, uh, you're going to need to do the full effectiveness trials. Um, and I think that still gives pharmaceutical companies a huge incentive to go through with, with the full trials uh, like they always have. Right? Uh, at the same time, if there's a drug that's safe out there and that might work and that I'm willing to pay my own money um, to get access to, I think it seems reasonable to let me do so. I certainly wish for myself that that option had uh, existed earlier in 2020. I mean, luckily I ended up not getting COVID, right? but if I had, I'd be <laughs> even more mad at the FDA. So. Follow-up question. I guess I'm envisioning a situation, right, where there might be the all recent Alzheimer's drug situations that are coming to mind, and and I think you know both safety and effectiveness in many of these are questionable. But, it, but for sure, effectiveness. You know, I think I think people with Alzheimer's or family members with Alzheimer's would be pretty desperate for anything that that might work. And I'm wondering if you think I'm envisioning a situation where the drug would come to market, the FDA says it's safe. And we're doing effectiveness trials, and and yet they're going to charge a million dollars a year for this drug, which is not atypical for drugs. First in class when they come to market. I'm just wondering if you have any comments on sort of that situation. Or yeah, that? yeah, a few thoughts. This is a really interesting one, um, where there's this Alzheimer's drug that probably doesn't work, uh, but the FDA approved it anyway, and and uh, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and you know, on the one hand, I don't, I think if they knew it wasn't going to be covered by insurance, and people could only buy this out of pocket. Um, I don't think they'd be charging a million dollars or anything close to it. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of interesting that this did get approved by the FDA under their current system where they're supposed to be testing for efficacy, and, and, but most independent people think oh, they shouldn't have approved it. It, it doesn't actually work. Um, and I'm kind of of two minds myself here, right? So I, I do, I think, value uh, choice and autonomy a lot more than the, F the FDA does. Right? And so I would like to be able to see people uh, able to make their own gambles on this if they want. At the same time, on the sort of scientific questions about effectiveness, if anything, I might want the FDA, FDA to be more strict. Um, and maybe that would become even easier if you did have this two-track system. Right? Um, but you know, science is hard. <laughs> Figuring out what, what really works is hard. Um, and you know, social science and, and medicine and, and even some of the hard sciences, we're going through this replication crisis now where we're realizing just how hard it is um, and how a lot of the studies uh, that have been published that say, you know, oh, this works, and for this reason, uh, they, they're probably wrong. <laughs> um, um, so if anything, yeah, I, I might want to see them push a little harder on, on what's really effective. Um, but I don't necessarily want to have to wait myself uh, for, for them to be convinced. Great. I have a lot more questions, but I think I'll open it up to the floor. I'll pass it to you. 
Thank you very much, Kay. The floor is now open for questions. As previously mentioned, uh, this event is being recorded for broadcast by Access Sacramento. In order to ensure that your questions and comments are properly captured for the recording, please offer them via the microphone that is to stage left. See, we have a queue going already. That's wonderful. Hi, uh, thank you very much. This was very, very interesting. I'm thinking, you know, this distinction between safety and effectiveness, and I was thinking in the case of ivermectin, for example, where a lot of people were saying, look, just encourage people to take ivermectin because maybe it will work, right? And then we will figure out, I mean, it's safe, it might work, and then we'll see if it's effective. But then in Peru, for example, where I'm from, they actually made it a, a public policy to distribute ivermectin. Bringing people back from that was incredibly hard. And it ended up having this, you know, competition between ivermectin and the vaccine. So distinguishing between safe and effective uh, without, you know, it, it might actually undermine people's trust in, in the real science that's backing up, you know, proof for effectiveness. Yeah, Makes so sense. One, one yeah, challenge here is that neither of these are totally binary, right? You can ask how, how safe and how effective. Um, and maybe for a, a drug that's extremely safe, you're willing to have a, a lower bar for effectiveness. For, for a drug that's not so safe, you want to have a higher bar for effectiveness um, or know that it's for, for, for a serious condition, um, which messes with the simple tracking, you know, two-tier tracking system a little bit. Um, uh, but I, I do kind of, you know, there are some things like vitamin D, for instance, where, where you'd have all these small trials that would say, well, maybe it works for COVID. Um, and I would say, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's totally safe, it's very cheap, why not try? And then there are other things where, you know, maybe there is a bigger cost to it, either in terms of money or, or side effects or, um, op, you know, opportunity costs where you're using up all these medic medication and some people actually do need it as an antiparasitic, um, where, yeah, the, the costs loom at least a little bit larger. Or people preferring one over the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that, that was the main issue. Or people preferring one over the other. That was the main issue in Peru. Just repeated for a recording. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to be t um, talking about um, the, the issue that you talk about trade ins. Um, all, first of all, all jobs, doesn't matter where you work, has a positive and a negative. McDonald's, their positive is the food is tastes good, but the negative, it could cause obesity, overweight, diabetes. Same thing with um, selling drugs, the, um, which is basically um, transmitted diseases when it comes to using donor needles. Um, same thing with prostitution. Do, um, um, STDs, but there's a solution to all those negatives, and the solution for the drugs is use clean needles. Don't um, we don't shouldn't have to and um, to um, trade in our freedom um, to to um, make to instead of to solve those problems. We should actually use find a solution to to not override um, to make it Ill drugs illegal or prostitution illegal. You try to find a solution to that, like. For, it, for the drugs, you, you clean needles by law, or you, you could be arrested for, for public safety. Same thing with prostitution. You want um, to sell your body? Fine. You gotta use um, condoms or, um, and, check or, and get tested for STDs before you do. Don't make it outlaw overall. So we shouldn't have to trade in our freedom to, 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 and, uh, um, to make something safe. In the 14th Amendment, Section 1, no, um, states no state should influence or no state should enforce a law that takes away, away our life, liberty, and prosperity. Which, and so the 14th Amendment forbids us from training all, uh, from the state, the politicians, for creating and enforcing those laws. But yet they do it anyways. Yeah. So sometimes there are these easier choices available, like I was saying, right? So some, I think there are some hard, inevitable trade offs. Uh, sometimes there's not. Um, yeah. Sometimes you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Um, I, I will um, bring up one more of these slides that I had hiding after the conclusion, conclusion uh, which is 
you know, I, I talked a lot about life expectancy by country, um, but there's also a lot of variation from state to state in the US, um, where California um, actually does pretty well on, on both of these measures. Um, spending is a little lower than average by US standards, uh, while life expectancy is, is in the top quarter of, of the US um, at about 80 years um, per person. Um, and it's not totally clear to me why this is, but I do sort of wonder about some of the public policy differences here. Um, like California being fairly early to legalize marijuana, which might trade off as a painkiller for some people versus the, the much more dangerous opioids. But, anyway. I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, you mentioned how the U.S. government requires foreign licensed doctors to be uh, retrained in the U.S. before they can practice. Um, so just as you mentioned how the CDC had to um, concede and allow for the use of COVID tests approved by the World Health Organization, um, do you predict that in much the same way the U.S. will waive the re-education requirement of foreign doctors uh, in, in need of the shortage of doctors? and as in sort of as a shortening, um, will they trade security and a uh, perceived ex expertise in exchange for an increased supply? I'd be surprised um, if we stopped making doctors redo their residencies. Um, what I think is probably more realistic um, is if they just give out more uh, visas or more green cards um, and so you let in more foreign doctors to redo their residencies. Um, I, I think we'd see that first, um, but your question does also remind me of, of one other potential solution to this pharmaceutical issue. Right? Um, you know, oh, if the FDA is being a little too slow or a little too strict, um, what can you do about that? Um, you know, I admit my sort of two-track um, preliminary, preliminary, uh, preliminary approval proposal is maybe a bit uh, radical. Um, one other possibility um, is to do some sort of uh, outsourcing to um, foreign agencies like the European Medical uh, Medicines uh, Agency, um, where, you know, if you pick some number, you know, but maybe if like five foreign countries that all have higher life expectancies than the US have all approved this drug, uh, then it's sort of automatically approved here, uh, unless the FDA finds enough evidence to the contrary to say like, no, they were all wrong, it's actually bad, uh, let's ban it here. Thank you, appreciate it. Do you mind? Would you mind putting that uh, slide of the life expectancy for uh, countries at the very end up again? Yeah, that one. So some of what you just said sort of uh, connects to my question, but it sounds like you're drawing a sort of causal arrow from our situation with regard to ban subsidies and mandates to that green line. And at least some of your argument is suggesting that, um, at least internationally, there's an international argument to be made here that, like with the doctor's question, that, the, that other countries are doing better with regard to that line than we are because they're better in those three regards. And I'm not sure if I heard the, 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 the argument the outline of the argument with regard to anything except the doctor. So I wonder if you maybe say more. And I also wanted to just, what struck, what jumped out at me here is that Japan seems to be in the sweet spot um, for health expenditure versus years. So I wonder if you'd say more about the international argument. Yep. You um, that, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I probably didn't fully uh, flesh all this out. Um, and to be honest, it is a mix, right? So there are some situations where um, most other rich countries do have more doctors per capita, more hospital beds per capita, which I don't think I mentioned. Um, but there are other things, other, other of these issues where they are sort of, you know, as strict as we are or more so, right? So for instance, the European Medical Agency, you know, they probably pr approve things roughly as fast as we do, roughly as many things. Uh, that's pretty similar across countries. Um, the subsidies are on average um, about as high in other rich countries, right? So people in, in most other countries are you know, also paying on average about 12, uh, 11 cents on the dollar, sometimes even less, right? Um, so it's, it's not um, only, right, that they're doing everything right and we're doing everything wrong or, or, um, or if we did everything they did, we'd be both um, freer and have better outcomes, right? Um, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis. There are some things where, 
uh, like training additional doctors. I do think we'd be more like the other countries and we'd get something of a free lunch. Uh, other cases, you know, the, the trade-offs are, are real. Um, one other country that's not on this graph uh, that I think would be even more of an outlier is, is Singapore, uh, which has uh, even lower uh, spending. They, they sort of have the lowest health spending per person uh, of all the rich countries. Um, so there's a lot to emulate there. And again, they do it uh, with life expectancies of like 80 to 83 years. Um, one other thing that's going on here, right, is um, it's not all about medicine, right? So one thing I always wonder about here, right, is, okay, t you, you see that the, the US is doing worse here on life expectancy, and, and a lot of people will then say, like, oh, that means we must have a worse medical system. And that doesn't necessarily follow, right? Um, it's at least logically possible. We could have the best medical system in the world. Right? Um, in some ways, I think we do, right? Um, you know, I'd, I'd put our top hospitals and our top doctors up against anybody's. Um, so what's the problem, right? Well, at least to some extent, it might, might, might be things outside the medical system, right? where maybe our um, health conditions and health behaviors um, might be you know, systematically worse. Right? Um, and the medical system you know, is just sort of struggling, struggling against that um, and not winning. Um, but that doesn't mean you know, that they're not putting up as good a fight as anybody else would. So um, in the um, presentation, you talked about uh, FDA trials, costs, um, the amount of time it takes for drugs to be approved. Uh, my girlfriend is a graduate student um, studying pharmacy, so I'm a little familiar with the situation. Um, I was wondering you know, where you kind of stand on the uh, approval of the COVID vaccine, because you did speak about the amount of time um, that it took for Moderna's vaccine to be approved, the amount of time that the uh, tests were approved. And the only reason I asked this question is because you did mention that you participated in the clinical trial for COVID vaccines. Um, so I, I'm assuming you do want FDA approvals to come down, correct? Yes, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm glad we have the ones um, that we do. Um, and I'm glad that they did it much faster than they usually do with these things, um, even though I think there were still a lot of obvious ways they could have uh, sped things up at a, at a very crucial time. So I, I wanted to ask about, um, I was really interested both in your praise of the recovery trial, but concern about the FDA's approach and potential trade-offs between taking a more deregulatory approach to access and being able to run a large-scale trial like the recovery trial. And more generally, I think my question is, with healthcare utilization, there are often um, sort of externalities or effects on third parties that might be different from other sorts of um, services consumption or, or utilization. And one thing I noticed that you didn't mention in ban mandate subsidies, you didn't mention taxes, which was really interesting to me. And I was curious, somebody the flip side of subsidies. But more, would taxes be an appropriate way in some circumstances, have they been underused as a way of trying to mitigate some of the externalities of health consumption decisions? And are there trade-offs between, for instance, making it easier for you to get Novavax outside the trial and being able to run the sort of big trials like recovery that really provided us valuable information and learning what works and what doesn't work in terms of combating COVID. That's a good point. Um, yeah, so I, I think part of the concern here is, well, why would people sign up for the clinical trials if they could get st the drugs out of the trials, right? And part of it is that you pay people, um, and I think part of it is that we could pay people more. Uh, we have this weird system where a lot of the institutional review boards that, that, that have to sign off in this research, they actually think it's coercive to, to pay people. Um, so this will actually tell you, oh, in order to be fair to these people, you need to pay them less, um, which seems crazy to me. Um, uh, and I, th I think that would be one um, way around that. On the other side, that's, that's true about taxes. Um, obviously, they, they, they do fit uh, into this co coercive framework um, well. And um, you know, if you 
the Supreme Court tells you that the, the individual mandate uh, fine, it was actually a tax, and, and that's why it's legal. I, um, so maybe I indirectly talked about them. Um, it might just be my, my sort of bias against talking about taxes, because I, I feel like everybody else talks about taxes, um, and I think uh, regulatory issues are sort of underrated uh, relative to, uh, to taxation, uh, but they are important here. And yeah, the, sort of the standard economist line here would be to tell you um, that you might want to tax unhealthy things. We, we've done this in a big way with smoking, um, and this, along with legal change and cultural change and, and spreading knowledge, is, is a big part of why uh, smoking rates are down dramatically over the last 50 years. Um, part of it is simply the, the taxes. Um, you know, people, you know, if people have an addiction, it, it's very hard to get them to quit, right? Um, so you could double the price, and they might only drop their consumption 10 or 20 percent. But we did double the price and then some um, uh, because of all these uh, cigarette taxes, and I think that has been a big part of the story there. Um, a lot of health economists would tell you to do a similar thing with alcohol. Um, I, I'm not holding my breath there politically, right? um, but there's this famous argument, um, this paper called uh, Taxes of Sin, um, which argues that even back in the 1980s when it was written, uh, the externalities from alcohol were much bigger um, than the externalities from smoking. Right? So smoking um, cigarettes, it's hard to make direct comparisons. It depends how much of each you're doing. right? But smoking cigarettes is probably worse for you than drinking alcohol. Right? Again, depends a lot on how much of each you're doing. Um, and yes, secondhand smoke is real, it'll hurt people around you. Um, but drinking alcohol, at least on average, hurts people around you even more, right? Um, at least when people have a few drinks, they tend to be dramatically more likely to crash their cars and other people get in fights with other people and so on. Um, and when these economics researchers crunched the numbers on this and the taxes of sin paper, um, they found like, oh yeah, the external costs of alcohol are way bigger than smoking. And even back in the 1980s, when we had higher alcohol taxes than we do today and dramatically lower cigarette taxes than we do today, they were arguing um, alcohol taxes were way too low and cigarette taxes were slightly too high if all you're trying to do is protect other people from the smokers. Um, and since then, uh, things have gone exactly in the wrong direction, you know, as, as they would say it. Uh, we're now, you know, cigarette taxes are way higher. Um, and alcohol taxes, they tend to slowly fall over time because they've been set mostly in um, dollars and cents terms and inflation adjusted, they, they just fall. But most people drink, so they don't want to pay alcohol taxes and most people aren't problem drinkers. So they're like, well, why do I want to pay taxes when it's somebody else you know, who's crashing their car? Um, uh, whereas with cigarettes, well now only 20% of people smoke and so the average voter is like, oh yeah, screw them. <laughs> Thank you very much for the talk. I, I appreciate not only the data, but the way you visualized it was quite accessible. Um, I'm curious in particular about uh, the information you posted on the number of years it takes to before you can practice medicine in the various different countries. Uh, you, you very briefly sort of uh, glossed over suggesting that uh, uh, th that's a barrier which probably isn't a, a good one because there isn't any obvious payoff for making them take longer. Um, and. If, if you're correct in that, then I think it's a pretty compelling case. But as an educator at an undergraduate institution, my knee-jerk reaction is to say, there's a value in making future doctors go through an undergraduate education. So uh, I'm curious if, to your knowledge, you know, if there's any way of, of specifically measuring if there are any benefits along, uh, that come along with requiring future doctors to complete an undergraduate degree before going to medical school. That's a great question. I don't know of any papers that have done this. Um... Ideally, you know, you'd want to find uh, you know, some people who were able to like, you know, you, you track some people in one program and, and do uh, some people into the other. Because uh, if you're just trying to compare across countries, there are so many things that are different across countries. I would love to see the experiment run. As far as I know, it hasn't been, um, but I haven't made an in-depth study of that in particular. So you got me thinking about this idea of moral hazard and how this might affect this green line up here. So it feels like that's inflating the expenditures in the U.S., and so that line would start shifting back. And then I'm thinking about plastic surgeries as well. This would also shift this back. Has anybody done any research on making those corrections? Um, yeah, so the, one, one question here is like, yeah, if you, if, you give, if you give people insurance, how much more are they gonna spend as a, as a result? Um, there's an old answer to that, which came from the RAND health insurance experiment, uh, where in the 1970s, the, the RAND Corporation, um, sort of an economic research think tank, basically, um, they got the funding to give 6,000 people free health insurance for three to five years just to see what they did. Um, 
And the, one of the basic answers there is they give some people really generous health insurance, some people less generous. And there was this question about, oh, how do you keep the people in the trial when they have the less generous insurance? They, they, they paid them some. Um, but it was, all, it was all free insurance, um, and, you, and you track them over the time. And the people who got the really generous insurance, um, it's like when you cut their share of spending in half um, relative to the others, they would spend, uh, they would use about 20% more care. Um, so that's one number there. Um, and interestingly, at least as of the end of five years, they weren't noticeably healthier. Right? Um, some of them went and got glasses. They could see better. Some of them went to a dentist. Their teeth were better. Most of the health measures, you know, they weren't like significantly better, but maybe five years wasn't long enough. Or maybe people will now say, well, that was the 1970s. This could be a lot different today. Um, today, the closest we've got to this experiment was with Medicaid. Um, so when Oregon expanded uh, Medicaid in the, in the early 2010s, um, they did an experiment too. Uh, they, they, didn't, they wanted to expand it to like a, a class that would be um, 100,000 more people. They didn't have the money for that. So they, th uh, they only had enough money to give it to like 20,000 people. So they said, okay, we'll, we'll randomize it. We'll do a lottery uh, about who gets, you know, again, free health insurance uh, with Medicaid. And you could track those people over time and, and see again, you know, yeah, they use somewhat more care, um, but not a ton more. In terms of correcting across countries, on average, you don't need to do it, right? So some of these countries, um, subsidize a lot less than we do. Some subsidize a lot more. Um, on average, they're they're about the same. Um, you know, so you don't need to correct on average. Although, you know, you'd see pretty different results across countries if you did. Right? Um, so some countries, like I think Greece or Mexico, people are, are spending more than 11 cents um, out of pocket uh, per dollar on average. Um, there are a few where they're spending spending less, uh, but on average, we're actually pretty pretty in line with everybody else there. Uh, we're just spending 11 percent of a bigger number. <laughs> Right? So that is why you know, Americans really might face have more, more trouble with care. Um, it's not because we're less subsidized, it's because we're subsidized a similar amount, on a, in, but on very high, um, higher prices. Yeah. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Fortunately, there is more to our symposium. We will have a break for lunch until 1.30 and then reconvene. We very much hope that you'll join us for the second half of our event. For now, please join me in thanking our speaker, our respondents, and uh, you all for your excellent questions.